Now, we now move on to two topics that we're very familiar with in this part of the world, and that is investing in energy and also geopolitical uncertainty. And I think it's fair to say that with you know, a growing population and also rising incomes, that the global energy system is growing at a rapid pace. And I'd like to welcome our next moderator, who is something of an institution in Abu Dhabi, which is Mark Cutis, the Group Chief Financial Officer of ADNOC, to discuss investing in energy and infrastructure amidst geopolitical uncertainty. Please welcome Mark to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So let me uh, greet our panelists. Please, gentlemen, have a seat. So Francisco Blanche to my left, Robert Johnston and Majid Zafar. Uh, originally, I was going to be part of the panel, but in this case, when I, s I realized who was on this panel, I decided, for the audience's sake at least, it's better to hear them than to hear me, so I'm going to be asking them the questions. Um, this is a very interesting topic, if you will. It's an amalgam of topics. It's geopolitics energy prices and what's happening around the world. So I just, we're going to focus a little bit on geopolitics and we'll also talk <laughs> to a certain extent about what's happening in the context of energy with the trade war um, and, and China and, and the US, how it affects energy prices. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how someone like Majid in the region involved in a difficult jurisdiction, Iraq, how he manages to survive and prosper. So I want to start off first with, uh, with Robert, who has been in the business for some time in oil and gas. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the arc of geopolitics and how it informs today's discussion m more than ever. So Robert, welcome. Uh, September the 19th, you wrote an article in the Council of Foreign Research, and you talked about what's happening in the region, and you pinpointed, to a certain extent, the the problems associated with um, uh, what the Iranians were doing. And, and you talked about uh, how the, on a stealth mode, they've increased sort of uh, the things they were doing, going after ships in the region, tankers in transit, and they went after a British tanker crew. And, and eventually, we know what happened in that cake, even though there's supposed to be questions about that. Um, oil prices didn't spike, and that was, that was sort of to a certain extent, unexpected. But if you just, more broadly, you think about the region, we've had uh, really riots in Iran, riots in Iraq. You've had, uh, I wrote it down, Lebanon. Uh, we know the problems in Syria. You know the issues associated in Yemen. Uh, Turkey showing hegemonic kind of uh, uh, pretensions for the, for the region. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in that context, because geopolitics has always colored the region, but now more so than ever. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that um, it's still a geopolitically driven story. And I think that, um, as you suggested, the APCAC attack didn't generate the normal price response in terms of an of a oil price shock, even a short-lived one, maybe a couple days of higher oil prices after that attack. And maybe that suggests something about how the geopolitics of the region are changing, that even with sanctions on Iran, uh, even with the attack against the Aramco facilities, um, the world is really much more focused on a different kind of geopolitics, which is on the demand side, right? It, there's a sense that there's a lot of spare capacity, that demand growth isn't particularly strong, uh, and that therefore these disruptions in supply are not impacting prices in the same way. But that's not to say that there aren't some structural trends here in the region that are problematic. I think we have um, protests in the countries you mentioned, but also around the world, including Latin America, including Western Europe, including places like Hong Kong. Um, we have uncertainties around the global growth picture with US-China. We have a very difficult US election coming up, which will have big foreign policy implications for the region. But I would say, going back to the Middle East, that one thing to think about is, for many, many decades, really since the 1970s, the Western countries, really organize their policy towards the Middle East around the idea of energy security. And it's interesting that this year, the IEA, in its World Energy Outlook, felt compelled to write a piece saying, is energy security still relevant? And I was like, yes, it is, definitely. <laughs> I think that certainly the fact that we need a reminder is telling. And it's really that the US in the age of shale and the age of Trump is less committed to the region 
than in the past, and that's going to create a whole new bunch of realities I think that we have to get used to here. Okay. Interesting. So I'm going to jump to you, Francisco, because on, on this issue of security and energy dependence, six years ago, you pointed out to me that the U.S. was going to become a dominant player because of shale oil. And you said one of the after effects would be that potentially the U.S. would lose interest in the Middle East. And it actually happened. And it, it's interesting that uh, during the Obama administration, they, did, they never picked up on what was happening with shale, even though it was in their backyard. And they focused a lot on renewables. So in, in the same vein, is the production of shale, oil, and gas going to continue accelerating at the pace it has in the past? Uh, tell us a little bit about the investors in that space and how they've done, and how do you see that shaping up, particularly with the inability of the U.S. to now export uh, oil and gas to, to China? Um, sure, Mark. So um, let, me, let me just start by pointing out that uh, energy as a share of uh, the S&P 500 has gone from 16% to 4% uh, throughout this magnificent uh, shale revolution. So effectively, America has become energy independent, but investors have lost a truckload of money um, supplying the capital to make that happen. So, um, so I, I, I don't think that the U.S. is going to continue to grow at the same pace it has in recent years. In fact, I think uh, investors are waking up to realize that uh, shale is a marginal cost business. And um, particularly in the past year, we've seen a lot of the capital supplied to the exploration and production companies in the U.S. dry, dry up, which means that um, bond yields for the less capitalized names have spiked. Equity values have continued to roll over. Um, and, uh, and this is going to have a very uh, significant impact on, on the medium-term outlook for the U.S. Because I think if you go back 10 years ago, uh, financial markets in America wanted to uh, believe in the energy independence story, wanted the U.S. to supply the marginal uh, barrel to the economy, the marginal BTU, and, and, and that happened. And the U.S. became independent, energy independent this year, although more independence has become interdependent, meaning that now the U.S. is exporting a lot, importing a lot. Remember, the U.S. still imports 6.5 million barrels a day of oil, mostly heavy, although it's now exporting two and a half million barrels a day. Um, but but I, think, I think capital markets have become a lot more skeptical about um, capital being allocated to energy. And, and I think over the course of the next five or 10 years, we're going to see uh, that, that capital in domestic industry continue to go into tech, into healthcare, into other sectors, and, and away, from, uh, away from, from oil and gas specifically. Um, so it doesn't mean the U.S. will not have a role to play. Clearly, interdependence is, is here to stay. Um, and, and we'll see continued U.S. LNG exports, and we'll see continued growth in some of the export markets, but at a much, much slower pace. Uh, and, and the main reason is that, as I said before, um, prices have come down to marginal cost economics, and there's simply better returns to be had in other uh, sectors. And, and the U.S. economy is very efficient at allocating that capital over time. Um, so can so I interrupt you for a second? So what does that mean in terms of the interplay with international oil companies? Will they still be as relevant as they were in the past, given that a lot of them are being forced now to live within their means in terms of not spending more than, you know, your cash flow should take care of your capex, your, right. your, you know, your debt repayments and your dividends. Right. So can they spend, have these big monster projects in Australia and other jurisdictions? So, so I think, I think there's, uh, there's already clearly a, an investment shortfall building up in the energy industry. Um, the only issue, Mark, is that um, supply curves have moved from being very vertical 10 years ago, where spikes in oil prices were uh, kind of calling for investments in the Arctic, in Brazil offshore, and all these very expensive projects that had a 10-year life cycle, uh, to basically flat supply curves, right? So we go from vertical to like flat supply curves, horizontal supply curves, where small movements in prices can trigger some kind of supply response. So my, my sense is that the world's going to adapt to this new uh, shale paradigm, and, and most of the uh, 
IOCs and are going to be continue to work on the basis of 50, 60, 65 dollar oil, um, and 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 they're going to start to face a new reality, which is electric vehicles, uh, big rotation in global energy demand to to alternatives um, like right, renewables, right? I mean, natural gas, for instance, in the U.S. You're at a stage now where the price keeps falling, and yet the cost of wind power and solar power keeps falling with it. So, so natural gas is in a bit of a race to the bottom, displacing thermal coal, and at, at the same time being displaced by wind and solar. So I think these dynamics are kind of where the, the energy industry is kind of trying to, to figure out. And, and it's, a, it's a major transition to, to a lower carbon world. Uh, so next thing so let me thank you for that. I'm going to go to you, Robert. If, we, if we're transitioning to a different world, what does that mean for Russia? Right, in the sense that they have focused a lot. They haven't really managed to diversify their economy. I think 60% of their budget is covered by oil revenues. And, and they continue to be uh, in, in international circles. You always find them there trying to create havoc in, in a certain way. What does that mean for Russia in the longer term in this kind of environment? Yeah, I think it's a couple factors. One is that um, I think in the next five years, Russia's fine. I think that they have the foreign exchange reserves, the stabilization fund. Uh, and a kind of a long track of production growth. But at some point, that will run its course. And I think with sanctions in place for the last few years, with the failure to diversify economically, as you mentioned, and with the failure to build real political institutions under Putin, I think in the sort of 10-year outlook, they could be much more constrained. So how will Russia fare if they can't reinvest and their production starts to decline and they don't have other sectors to fall back on? That could be a recipe for a much more unstable Russia 10 or 15 years down the road. An unstable Russia could mean more nationalism towards Eastern Europe or towards Syria and other places as well. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to turn to you, Majid, because if I, if I listen to the first two speakers about you know, the, how things will look out in, in the future for the price of oil, and you have a kind of a tough job being in Iraq, but Iraq has been an interesting place. So they've gone from one and a half million barrels of oil to six million in terms of production, five. five. But meanwhile, <clears throat> there has been a lot of, well, less than untoward behavior towards the population, and we've seen that in terms of what's happened. H how do you manage to deal with a, in a place like Iraq? Because you're there as a business person every day. So I think uh, w with Iraq, um, as you mentioned, going from one and a half million to five million barrels a day, despite all the challenges, the war on ISIS, the lack of infrastructure, the corruption, the lack of legislation. They haven't even passed the oil law yet. They've been trying to do that for 10 years. So it just gives you some indication of the, the reserve potential there, which I believe will even exceed uh, Saudi Arabia. It's so underexplored. It's kind of like Saudi Arabia 50 years ago. Uh, the potential is there for oil, but also gas. Uh, there's a big uh, domestic market and potential for uh, export. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's less than 10% the gas utilization per capita of the UAE, for example. The challenges are, are many. Uh, you, you mentioned the demonstrations and the terrible killings that have happened in, in recent days. As we heard this morning, uh, it's really uh, the young people have had enough. They want better services, including electricity. Uh, jobs uh, and a system that isn't mired by corruption and, and sectarian uh, politics. And it's not the only country in the region, Lebanon and others. Now, we're still optimistic. As a group, we've invested over $3 billion in the country over the last 10 years, and, and that rate of investment is actually increasing going forward. There are areas of the country that are more stable relatively, such as the Kurdistan uh, region. Uh, and we think that the, that the potential is large. And the Middle East, North Africa region overall, we've got half the world's oil and gas reserves, uh, probably even underreported, because we haven't done that much exploration. Uh, we have a third of the world's oil production, a sixth of the world's gas production, and we're punching way below our weight. And as we just heard over the last decade, we've given up a lot of market share to the growth in the US. And by the way, I, I think what happened in the US has been great, not only for US economy, but the world economy, and indeed for the international oil and gas sector. Uh, but we have the lowest uh, cost per barrel here in the region, 
But apart from the geopolitics, we've got regulatory issues that we need. We've been overly dependent on the state to fund everything. And some of the reforms we've seen, whether it is you know, the Aramco IPO or some of the great things Abnoc has done here, uh, new models for partnering with the private sector, including on, on uh, exploration, that needs to happen more widely across our region for us to truly be competitive. So in order for Iraq to develop its reserves, which you said are substantial and could rival Saudi Arabia, what does that mean for OPEC? Uh, how do you see that developing? So <clears throat> Iraq has been committed to OPEC. It's where uh, OPEC was founded. Uh, in fact, I think it's 1960, so a big anniversary coming up next year uh, in, in Baghdad. Uh, but ultimately, OPEC quotas are, end up being based on uh, reserves and production capacity. So it'll adjust over time. Their, their, their bigger bottlenecks now are, are around the infrastructure, the export uh, infrastructure. I think uh, a challenge that, that I see is in, in terms of capital, in terms of cost of capital, uh, and this sense you have, even though the reserves may be here, at least for the private sector, a lot of the capital comes from Western markets, and there is this backlash we're seeing in recent years against the oil and gas sector. I think it's being unfairly maligned. I'm proud to work in an industry that's you know, transformed human standard of living over the last century. Uh, and it's being misconstrued. We're kind of being painted as the new tobacco here. Uh, and actually, breaking it down, oil and gas are very separate. Transport markets are quite separate from, from power markets. And actually, you know, everybody's focusing on electric cars. They're really cool. My dad has a Tesla. but. The reality is natural gas substituting for coal has had a hundred times more impact on lowering emissions over the last five years than the five million electric cars. It, it, it's actually the equivalent of if you took 500 million cars, all the cars in China and the US, half the cars in the world, and converted them to clean electric tomorrow. But we don't get the credit for that. And, and that's not from me, that's from the IEA, from the consumer side. So there's, there's misconceptions, and as Bill Clinton used to say, we need to get beyond the headlines and get to the bottom line. And it's very inspiring seeing young people uh, in the West calling for action on climate change, and I totally uh, you know, agree with that. The problem is the West is not where the emissions are growing. If Asia keeps adding a new coal-fired plant every week, as it is, you know, them, whatever the West does, whatever the OECD does, is the equivalent of you know, rearranging the furniture in the bedroom while the living room is on fire. So there's got to be a global uh, action to really tackle uh, those emissions around carbon pricing and other initiatives. Thank you. You mentioned uh, US and China cars. I'm going to turn to the US-China trade war. Um, Francisco, what's the connection? Is there a connection? And then I want to ask you, Robert, too, between shale, China, trade war, what's going on there? You also had mentioned an interesting, you, you're very good at coining things. You talked the 10, 30, 50 world. And tell us a little bit about that. Right. No, so, so um, I mean, I think, I think if you, if you uh, want to understand what's going on in the oil market right now, you've got to remember three, uh, three numbers, 10, uh, 30, and 50. Uh, 10 stands for the weakest demand conditions in 10 years, which are directly linked to the ongoing US-China trade war, in my view. Uh, global trade has collapsed, and uh, President Trump has single-handedly uh, shut down global trade, um, which, which has really led us to these very weak demand conditions. But against these very weak demand conditions, we've had these huge disruptions. Uh, Venezuela, Iran, of course, we had the uh, uh, upcake attack, which also took out supply, but in the context of very, very weak demand. Uh, and I think we have the weakest supply conditions in 30 years, by the way, since the, uh, the Persian Gulf War in 91. Uh, we've also had OPEC cuts on top and renewed OPEC cuts as of last Friday. Um, and then in terms of 50, the, the 50 number reflects the U.S. unemployment rate. It's the lowest in 50 years, which is um, a little ironic because the Fed has been cutting rates three times this year, and central banks around the world have been cutting rates pretty aggressively to prevent a downturn. So as we go into 2020, I think, I think this is going to create a, a bit of an inflationary tailwind that will help the energy sector um, do a little better in the first half of, uh, of uh, 2020. 
But how is this connected to, to, the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the trade war to the, to the energy independence story? It's actually, you can see it very easily through the US trade balances. Back in 2010, the US spent 50% of its uh, foreign dollars buying energy from abroad. And, and, and this petrodollar exports, right, which a lot of it came here to the Middle East, um, suddenly turned and started going to China. Uh, and, and, and as a result, um, we've, we've ended up with a trade deficit, which is just about as big as it was back in 07, 08, except for rather than 50% being energy, it's 100% being gadgets, mostly from China, <laughs> uh, which has ultimately, um, I think, uh, pressured US manufacturing and US industry and, and, and led to the kind of trade turmoil that we have today uh, and the, tr the, the kind of uh, political tensions that have come on the back of trade. So, so I think, I think the, uh, definitely energy independence in some ways has triggered um, or partly triggered uh, the, uh, the, the, the ongoing trade war because it has hit uh, some, some politically powerful groups in the US, particularly uh, unions and, and different industries that have become very loud in terms of their um, uh, concerns about all these cheap imports uh, hitting the US market. So, so I, I, that's another issue I think is gonna stay on for a while. I think the trade war is, is, uh, is definitely has changed the mood. I think in the US today, uh, you will not find any politicians on the right or on the left that are either uh, pro-China or pro-trade. So, so even if we get a phase one deal in the next uh, week or two or next month, I don't think it's going to lead to a protracted um, uh, period of uh, trade peace, if you like. Uh, so I think that's, that's, gone. that's negative, I mean, ultimately. That's negative, and it's <coughs> negative for transportation, because um, even if we get a rebound in the first half of next year, which I think we will, we'll have a restocking cycle, it's going to be hard to believe that we'll have a, a, a big uh, surge in global growth under, under weak uh, uh, trade growth. So it market. doesn't sound good for the stock market. I mean, just to kind of throw that in. Well, stock market is a lot more driven by, by monetary policy dynamics. Remember, uh, what's the alternative to investing in, in U.S. equities? Uh, buying 10-year German bonds are minus, minus 30 basis points? Exactly. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, monetary policy plays a huge role here. Okay, but you've had this bed of air which has you know, kept the markets up, but... You know, that, that can just go on for so long. So let, let me ask you, Robert, you live in Washington. <clears throat> so what's going on there? What's the mood in terms of the trade conflict? And we keep hearing, I'm about to solve this, I'm about to do this, I'm about to do that. <clears throat> Sorry, what's going on there? Well, I guess the question is at what point should we move from trade conflict to just regular conflict conflict, <laughs> right? I think trade is an important element of the U.S.-China tensions. But if you view this from Beijing's perspective, I think they feel like increasingly this is a U.S.-led effort to contain China, to uh, contain their influence over East Asia, to interfere and, and attempt to govern how they manage different issues within their own economy, uh, and to prevent them from becoming a global technology leader. Not saying that's what I think, I think that's what, how they're viewing this crisis from the U.S. So when we talk about phase one, and we talk about <coughs> section 232, and these different commercial issues, they're all wrapped in a larger geopolitical layer. And I think that this is probably going to be the new normal, right? I think that even with the phase one deal, even if the U.S. administration changes, I think you'll still see Democrats looking to contain China as well. Um, and I think that, you know, when, when China joined the WTO 20 years ago, uh, at that time, their oil demand was about 4 million barrels a day. Now it's 12. So it was a, a period of very strong growth for them. The next decade will be very different, right? It's going to be a period of slower growth, not a collapse, but not the same kind of demand growth that we've been used to from China. I think we'll see more demand growth in Southeast Asia, India being more relevant, but these U.S.-China tensions will manifest itself in oil as well. So in terms of next year, I'm just going to change the focus a little bit. You see what, from a, from a geopolitical standpoint, in investment activities will be sort of curtailed or people will yeah. be concerned and not come back to you? Francisco. Well, I think there's a couple of uncertainties next year for, for oil and gas. One is obviously U.S. and China, as we've been discussing. I think you'll see some short-term relief on U.S.-China because you'll get a phase one agreement, and I think Trump will try to de-escalate before the election. But these larger structural issues that I mentioned will not be resolved. The second one, which Francisco mentioned, is shale. Right? I think that you know, U.S. shale is slowing down pretty quickly, but I think it still has one more year of growth left. So investors will be looking for a little bit more uncertainty about where the shale plateau is as well. 
And then the third issue, which is quite relevant for this region, of course, is if the Democrats do win the election, what will their Iran policy be? Right, will they go back to the Obama deal? And if so, does that mean a bunch of Iranian oil coming back into the market as well? So I'd see those as three big tensions to look at next year. So if they win, you'll see them sort of curtailing shale or shutting it well, down? Well, actually, I, th I think it's for the Democrats, there's been a lot of threats to curtail fracking and, and curtail shale production. But I think they're pretty hollow. I, in fact, I think that if Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders get the nomination, they'll have to backtrack. I just don't see how um, the Democrats can expect to win states like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio with a fracking ban. Okay. So what does that mean for you, Francisco? Do you, what do you see for the election? We've kind of veered off course here, but... So, so we, are, we are constructive on oil prices for, for the next six months. Uh, we, are, we believe Brent will break $70 a barrel, um, mostly because we think there's going to be a restocking cycle. And even though you have uh, more non-OPEC supply, because remember, you have Norway bringing out uh, Sverdrup's field, you have Brazil, you have Guyana, which just started a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's uh, Hess's and Exxon's project. Um, you, have, um, uh, you also have Canadian oil increasing. Um, you still have the OPEC cuts, and, and, and you have a cyclical recovery in demand, in, in our opinion, driven by that, that, that potential phase one deal. Um, so that gets us to a recovery. Now, longer term is a little more challenging because oil is the fuel of trade, and, and that's going to be, um, that's gonna be a, I think, a, a, a challenge over the next three, four years as the trade war evolves. And, and then medium term, we have the electric vehicle and, <laughs> and, and the energy transition. Um, so, so that's the view on oil. Um, on, on gas, we are actually quite bearish. We think gas prices will, will break the Jefferson. Uh, the Jefferson is the $2 bill, uh, you know, just going to show it here, just so everyone uh, knows this is a Jefferson, it's a $2, two bill, right? Uh, so we think gas prices in the U.S. will be below $2 a barrel, uh, $2 an MMBTU, right? So we'll see below $2 an MMBTU gas um, in 2020, and, and part of it is just the massive surplus of gas. America keeps producing gas that it doesn't need and has to push it out, but remember, it's also tariffing away the same countries that have to buy this gas, uh, which in turn are, are putting their own tariffs on America's gas, and that's why, why China's kind of put that 25% tariff. So, so I, I think gas will, will have a pretty challenging year uh, in 2020, but oil will be behave a little better. Great. Majid, <clears throat> you're in the region, you're a producer. How does all this impact your thinking, if at all? So first of all, on the U.S., just building on the issue of independence. I mean, independence is, is a myth, but self-sufficiency. But actually, you know, what, the interesting point that was made is, it, as a result, the interdependence grows. By becoming an exporter, a net exporter for both, potentially, it starts to worry about markets. And that's a completely different kind of dependence. And in fact, two things happened this year. One is the U.S. becoming the biggest producer in the world. The second is the U.S. economy now, in terms of GDP overall, does better if oil prices are higher. That's the first time for decades that that's the case. And that changes all the calculations. Granted, it's not even across the country. And maybe in some important election states, they do worse off. And, 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 and that's to be taken into account for, for the elections. But overall now, their economy is kind of on OPEC's side, which changes the whole uh, dynamic. From our point of view in the region as a private sector uh, player, I think all this is good, uh, but we've got to be focusing on addressing what we need to do here to improve the investment climate for the private sector. The capital is there, but it's being questioned now more and more, as we said, ESG and, 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 and other pressures. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, whether it's sour projects or deeper projects or gas projects, you can't just rely on the same old investment models that worked for oil 20, 30 years ago. Great. So I want to thank our panelists. We didn't even talk about ESG really in any depth. We didn't talk about the climate implications of what's happening in the Middle East and what that's doing for the refugee crisis. There's a lot more to discuss, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.